80,000 Palestinians flee Gaza city of Rafah. Deadly explosion at firecracker factory in southern India. Hello and good afternoon and Salam Lisa Madani. Thanks for joining us. I'm Otto Othman and you're watching World Today. The United Nations reveals that more than 80,000 people have fled the southern Gaza city of Rafah since Monday as Israeli tanks reportedly mass close to built up areas amid constant bombardment. Palestinian fighters said they were targeting Israeli troops to the east. Israeli occupation forces claim that its ground forces are conducting targeted activity in eastern Rafah. The UN also warned that food and fuel were running out because it was not receiving aid through nearby crossings. Israeli troops took control and closed the Rafah crossing with Egypt at the start of their operation, while the UN said it was too dangerous for its staff and lorries to reach the reopened Kerem Shalom crossing with Israel. It came as Israel's Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu rejected a threat by the U.S. President Joe Biden to stop supplying some weapons if it launched a major assault on population centers in Rafah. Netanyahu said Israel could stand alone if necessary. But with more than a million displaced Palestinians sheltering there, the U.N. and Western powers have warned that an all-out assault could lead to mass civilian casualties and a humanitarian catastrophe. Meanwhile, the commander of British forces in Cyprus said on Thursday that airdrops through Jordan by a coalition of Western and Arab states are an incredibly effective way to distribute aid to Palestinians in Gaza. Air Vice Marshal Peter Squares said Britain's Royal Air Force was making its 11th airdrop by the Royal Air Force, which reached a cumulative total of 110 metric tons of aid on Thursday. I mean, I couldn't comment on the details on the ground, but what I can see is international pressure to maximise the aid going into Palestine is huge. And therefore, it's something that we will be part of and continue to ensure we maximise that humanitarian aid into Palestine. There have been several deaths from parachute failure when airdropped aid fell on Gazans waiting for them. With land routes into Gaza hard to access and not fully operational, Jordan has led a coalition of Western and Arab air forces that has focused on airdrops in northern Gaza where the needs are greater and the risk of famine is reaching catastrophic levels. Israel qualified for this weekend's Eurovision Song Contest grand finale as thousands of demonstrators marched through Sweden's Malmö to protest its participation over the Gaza war. Singer Eden Golan performed her song Hurricane in Thursday's second semi-final without incident in front of 9,000 spectators at the Malmö Arena and booked her place in Saturday's final after a tellet vote. Earlier in the day, more than 10,000 people, including climate activist Greta Thunberg, gathered in Malmo's main square before marching through the southern city's central pedestrian shopping street. About 50 protesters made it to the front of the Malmo arena, where the event is taking place before being dispersed by a heavy police presence. Protesters also enter the Eurovision village, where spectators can follow the concert on large screens. Tens of thousands of people marched through the center of the Armenian capital, Yerevan, on Thursday, protesting against a government decision to cede land to ARCFO Azerbaijan. Armenia has agreed to hand over territory it has controlled since the 1990s and started border demolition efforts in a bid to secure an elusive peace deal with Baku and avoid another bloody conflict. The two South Caucasus nations have been locked in a standoff over disputed territory, primarily Nagorno-Karabakh since the breakup of the Soviet Union. Demonstrators began marching to the capital following protests six days ago in Armenia's Tavush region, where the government has agreed to hand over some territory. 
Azerbaijan seized Nagorno-Karabakh in a lightning offensive last year, causing almost the entire local population of more than 100,000 ethnic Armenians to flee. Armenian Prime Minister Nikol Pashinyan has since agreed to cede control of four Azerbaijani villages in the Tavush region that Armenia's forces took in the 1990s. But the consensus have sparked weeks of protests by people who have blocked major roads in a bid to force Pashinyan to change course. South Sudan's government launched a new round of peace talks with rebel groups in Nairobi, with Kenya mediating after earlier negotiations fell apart in 2022. Following a request from President Salva Kiir, Kenya agreed to step in as mediator, appointing former army commander Lazarus Sumbayowo to lead the talks. Sumbayowo previously mediated a 2005 peace deal between Khartoum and South Sudanese rebels, paving the way for South Sudan's independence for Sudan six years later. The world's newest nation has suffered from chronic instability since winning independence, including a civil war that killed nearly 400,000 people between 2013 and 2018. One of the world's poorest nations despite oil resources, South Sudan has endured natural disasters and an economic crisis, with political infighting fueling further violence. Some 9 million people are in need of humanitarian assistance, according to the UN. The crisis is compounded by the return of hundreds of thousands of South Sudanese refugees fleeing Sudan's brutal war. And the, language of brother. the bodies of seven laborers shot and killed by gunmen near Pakistan's southwestern Ghadar port were taken to Karachi. Police said the gunmen stormed into a house some 25 kilometers east of the port city and shot and killed the laborers in their sleep early on Thursday. The port city is located in troubled southwestern Baluchistan province, which borders Afghanistan and Iran. No one has claimed responsibility. Baluch separatist militants have in the past targeted laborers from eastern Punjab province, like the ones in the latest shooting. Last month, the Baloch Liberation Army claimed the killing of nine laborers from Punjab province, who were abducted and then shot at close range after gunmen stopped a bus. The separatists have long been fighting the government to demand a greater share in the mineral-rich province's natural resources. Qadar is the site of several Beijing-backed projects under the $65 billion China-Pakistan Economic Corridor investment as part of the Belt and Road Initiative. One person has died in a massive blaze on an industrial park housing as gas storage facility in eastern Thailand with hundreds ordered to evacuate. Now, the fire in a gas storage tank at Maftafut Industrial Port in Yangroyang province started around 10.35 a.m. The Industrial Estate Authority of Thailand, IEAT, said four people were hurt in the blaze, with one person later dying of their injuries in hospital. Video shared by local media showed dense clouds of black smoke erupting from the storage tank with the roaring flames leaving dark fumes hanging over the industrial park. Ataya Ataya Noal Utai, head of Rayong Province's Disaster Provincial and Mitigation Office, said about 200 people had been evacuated from the area without providing more details. IEAT said it was not clear what had started the conflagration. There has been a noticeable increase in reported fires in Thailand recently, coinciding with vicious heat waves sweeping South and Southeast Asia. Firefighters were at the scene of an explosion at a firecracker factory in the southern Indian state of Tamil Nadu, with debris scattered around the site and remnants of firecrackers on the ground. Video from the site showed firefighters spraying water on the hot debris to avoid further damage. The explosion resulted in at least nine deaths, with emergency crews responding to the disaster. The cause of the blast remains unknown, highlighting ongoing concerns about industrial safety in India, while officials investigate the deadly explosion. A Boeing passenger plane came off the runway during takeoff from Dhaka International Airport early Thursday, injuring 11 people and shutting the hub for hours. 
Airport Management Company, LAS, said the Air Senegal flight was bound for the Malian capital, Bamako, and had 78 passengers on board, plus a crew of six, including two pilots. The Boeing 737-300 had been chartered from privately owned Trans Air. Eleven people were injured, four of them seriously. Six other passengers were taken for medical checkups inside the airport. L'avion à la fin de la piste, il n'a pas pu décoller et le pilote a choisi de faire sortir l'avion sur le terrain à côté. Je pense que personnellement, je pense qu'il a bien géré la situation. L'avion n'a pas trop endommagé. Quand il s'est arrêté, les passagers étaient en bonne santé. Blaise Dien Airport at Diaz, 50 kilometers from the Senegalese capital Dhaka, reopened shortly after midday. The Transport Ministry said the Bureau of Investigation and Analysis had opened an inquiry to determine the cause of the accident. It comes as Air Senegal faces criticism with passengers regularly complaining about delays to domestic and international flights. Coming up next, Japan's Mount Fuji barrier delayed. Argentine unions launched a huge general strike against painful austerity measures and planned reforms by new liberation president Javier Millet, whose cost-cutting drive has stabilized local markets but hammered the real economy. The South American country saw public transport, the important grains crushing sector, supermarkets, airports and banks grind to a halt for 24 hours as most of the major unions joined the protest action against the government. The strike has seen flights suspended, ports paralyzed and schools and universities with minimal functions. The government criticized the strike as unjustified and said it would simply hit people who wanted to work, something reflected on the quiet streety streets in Buenos Aires. Millet, an economist, won a shock election last year, pledging to fix the chainsaw and economic crisis that snowballed under previous governments, leading to depleted reserves and also triple-digit inflation. Many in Argentina still back his plans after so many years of turmoil. However, his pro-market stance and tough austerity medicine have hurt people's real salaries, pushed up already high poverty levels and seen economic activity tank at the start of the year. Western Union had resumed its remittance service from the U.S. to Cuba after the system collapsed more than three months earlier, restoring a vital lifeline for Cubans and their friends and families in the U.S. Western Union services to Cuba had been disrupted since 28th January, forcing Cubans who depend on the company's money transfer system to seek alternative and often more costly routes for receiving money. Western Union, among the world's top providers of money transfer services in February, said services had collapsed due to technical issues with the processing of transactions in Cuba and said the outage only affected the Caribbean island only. Neither the Cuban government nor Western Union has specified the cause of the technical issue. Western Union resumed remittance to the island in 2023, nearly three years after the Trump administration put in place sanctions that triggered a halt in service. Studies show that almost 70 percent of the Cuban population receives remittance in varying forms, according to 2023 report from the United Nations Economic Commission for Latin America and the Caribbean. A scorching heat wave hit Mexico with high temperatures and strong solar radiation. In Mexico City, residents sought relief from the sweltering conditions by bathing in fountains, using fans and shielding themselves from the sun's relentless rays with umbrellas. A maximum temperature of 33 degrees Celsius was recorded in the country's capital on Thursday. Meanwhile, the colonial and tourist city of Oaxaca, southern Mexico, has been experiencing high temperatures since the weekend, which have kept the thermometers above 35 degrees Celsius with thermal sensations of 40 degrees Celsius. 
The scorching sun in a dry environment have forced locals and visitors to wear umbrellas and hats. Mexico is experiencing its second heat wave of the spring season, with temperatures above 30 degrees Celsius across the country. Electricity demand and unseasonably hot weather have caused power outages in at least 15 states, and drought has affected dam levels. The horse trapped on a roof due to flooding in Canios, south of Brazil, was finally rescued by a joint team of firefighters and veterinarians. The horse, which had been at the place for at least 24 hours, went viral when images of the equine trapped on the tin roof were released. It was initially thought that the helicopter would be used to rescue him, but he was eventually tranquilized and brought ashore by boat. Over 100 people have died and at least 1.4 million have been affected by heavy flooding in Brazil's southmost state, Rio Grande do Sul. Tourists have a few more days to snap Mount Fuji at a popular vantage point after Japanese authorities on Thursday said that the construction of a barrier has been delayed. Now, Fujikawaguchiko town is building a screen to deter people from taking pictures of Japan's most famous landmark from a pavement opposite a, Loss a Lawson convenience store. Residents complained that the visitors caused the traffic problems and behaved badly in their desperation for the perfect Instagram post of the snowy-capped volcano. The barrier was originally scheduled to be in position last week and then by mid-May, but a town official said that there were problems getting the required materials delivered. Lawson issued a statement on Sunday to deeply apologize to the local residents, store customers and the many other people who have been inconvenienced and troubled by the popularity of the vantage point. The convenience store chain said it had dispatched staff from Lawson headquarters and put up signs in multiple languages stating that crossing the street in front of the store is prohibited. Meanwhile, hikers using the most popular route to climb Mount Fuji this summer will be charged 13 US dollars each, with numbers capped to ease congestion and improve safety. Famous landmarks and monuments like the Arc de Triomphe in Paris, the Samuel Beckett Bridge in Dublin, and the Hofburg Palace in Vienna will lit up one month ahead of the European elections. Some other buildings illuminated in the colors of the European Union were the Brussels and Vilnius town halls, the presidential palace in Bratislava, Fort St. Angelo in Malta, Castello Francesco in Milan, and Torre Glories in Barcelona. The European elections are taking place all over the European Union from 6th to 9th June. Coming up in sports, Leverkusen reached Europa League final, unbeaten streak at record 49. Former Ivorian footballer Didier Drogba lit the Olympic cauldron at the end of the first day of the Paris 2024 torch relay in Marseille on Thursday. The Olympic flame landed on French soil the day before amid tight security on Wednesday, firing the starting gun on a summer extravaganza of sport. The flame arrived in Marseille, a port city in southern France founded by Greek merchants after a 12-day trip from Greece on board the Bellum, a 128-year-old three-masted tall ship that once transported sugar from France's colonies in the West Indies to the Metropole. Ex-NBA basketball player Tony Parker was earlier among those carrying out torchbearer responsibilities along a route that ended at the Stade Velodrome, where Drogba played for Olympic Marseille before moving to Chelsea in 2004. This is just the start of the 12,000-kilometer torch relay across France and its far-flung overseas territories before the opening ceremony in Paris on 26th July. Marcelo Brozovic scored a late winner as Al Nassar claimed a 3-2 win at Al Oudoud in the Saudi Pro League early this morning. And the win keeps Al Hilal's title celebrations on hold, with the leaders needing just a point from their remaining four games to be crowned champions.
Al Nasser started the game in cruise control and took an early lead thanks to a stunning goal by Brozovic and never looked in trouble after taking the lead. Cristiano Ronaldo soon followed up with a second goal of the night after Saeed Al Rabi gave away the ball to Ali Al Hassan in the box, who found the Saudi Pro League top scorer with ease in front of an open goal. Al Ohdud managed to garner more control in the second half, and goals from Hassan Al Habib and Sevar Goldwyn brought them level. However, in another twist in the tail, a late half volley from Brozovic handed Ronaldo's side all three points on the night. Despite having denied Al Hilal the title this morning, Al Nasser's win may have done nothing but delay the inevitable, as avoiding defeat on Saturday would be enough for Al Hilal to confirm their place as champions. If that does happen, Al Nasser will have to give Hilal a guard of honor on 17th May. Bayer Leverkusen set a new European unbeaten record of 49 successive games in securing a late draw with Roma to reach the Europa League final. Josep Stanic scored the last kick of the game in the 97th minute to earn Xavi Alonso's side a 2 all draw on the night and a 4-2 aggregate victory. Roma, who had lost the first leg in Italy but were much improved in Germany, drew level in the tie through two Leandro Paredes penalties. But a disastrous own goal from Gianluca Mancini handed Leverkusen the crucial advantage in the two-legged semi-final before Croatia defender Stanicic ensured history with the latest in a long line of Leverkusen late goals. They have now gone 49 successive games without defeat in all competitions, including 40 victories. It means Leverkusen, who were knocked out by Roma at this stage last season, better the unbeaten run the Eusebio led Benfica side managed between December 1963 and February 1965. Alonso's men, who are seeking a treble this season, having won the Bundesliga title and also reached the German Cup final, will face Italian side Atalanta in the Europa League showpiece in Dublin on 22nd May. Ten-time champion Rafael Nadal overcame losing the opening set to defeat Belgian qualifier Zizal Bergs a 4-6, 6-3, 6-4 and reached the Italian Open second round in Rome on Thursday as the Spaniards' steady progress continued. Nadal, who last won the title in Rome in 2021, was given a stiff test by the 24-year-old in a match which lasted almost three hours on center court and now faces Polish seventh seed Hubert Hukac. The 37-year-old former world number one broke first to make it 3-1 in the opening set. But Bergs bounced back immediately with a break of his own and broke again to make it 5-4 before holding serve to take the set. Nadal steadied himself and made an impressive start to the second set, taking a three-love lead after an early break and winning both service games to love. And although Bergs forced break points in two later games, Nadal held on. The deciding set brought another early break for Nadal to take a 2-1 lead. Bergs then had four break points when 4-2 down, but lost his chance to get back into the match, and Nadal finished off the job. Spain's Fabio Sanchez claimed victory on stage six of the Giro d'Italia on Thursday as he outsprinted two other breakaway riders at the uphill finish at Ropalo Nono Therm. Sanchez of Movistar, Francis Julien Alaphilippe of Sondal Quickstep, and Luke Plop of Jaco Alula kept clear of the chasing peloton at the climax of the 180 kilometer ride. But the 24-year-old Sanchez had the legs to hold Alaphilippe and his fellow Giro debutant Plop at bay. Tadej Pogacar, the race leader, finished safely in the peloton to retain the Magla Rosa going into Friday's time trial. The Fast and Furious stage featuring two of the gravel sections used at this year's Stade Brianche took the riders on an undulating route through the Tuscan countryside. 
After a day of constant attacks, a league group was eventually established, but that was whittled down to just three as the dusty gravel section began to take their toll. At one point, Plop was the virtual race leader, but the peloton, powered at the front by the Ineos Grenadiers, gave chase and finished only 29 seconds behind. Pogacha, the race favorite, resisted any urge to go for the stage victory, but looked rock solid in the peloton on a day when the average speeds reached 44 km per hour over four hours of racing. Pogacha leads the overall battle by 46 seconds from Ineos Grenadiers Geraint Thomas, with Danny Martinez and Bora Hansgore in third, a further second back. Danny Sordo made a triumphant return to the FIA World Rally Championship WRC stage on Thursday by setting the fastest pace during the Vodafone Rally de Portugal shakedown. Now, despite being away from competition for nearly six months, the Spanish driver wasted no time finding the rhythm, steering his Hyundai i20N to the front of the leaderboard. Sardos' second run through the 4.61-kilometer Balter stage clocked a time that put him just ahead of his Shinde teammates Ot Tanak and Terry Neville, besting them by 0.5 and 0.9 seconds respectively. This impressive performance came in Sardos' 190th WRC rally and his first appearance since the Forum 8 rally Japan last November. Meanwhile, reigning world champion Kelle Rovenpera showed promise in his Toyota GR Yaris before a hybrid issue forced him to the Matosinhos service park early. He still managed to secure eighth place despite the setback. Sebastian Ogier of Toyota delivered a strong further fourth place finish, trailing Tanak by a mere tenth of a second. The Frenchman aims to make up for his disappointment after going off the road during the 2022 Portuguese rally. M Sport Ford's Adrian Formal rounded out to the top five, just 0.1 seconds behind Auger. That concludes today's edition of World Today. In our top story, 80,000 forced to flee Rafah as Israel expands attacks. Till then, I'm Otto Othman from the river to the sea. Palestine will be free. Thanks for watching and have a pleasant day ahead.